I am, Mikko Hyppönen. And I've been in this industry for longer than some of you guys have been alive. And that's not even a joke, because I started analyzing malware, researching security, and reverse engineering viruses almost 25 years ago. And when we started analyzing viruses 25 years ago, viruses spreading on five and quarter inch floppy disks, it was almost sort of like a funny game. Because our enemy at the time, the people who were writing these early viruses, were teenagers. In fact, teenage boys, every single one of them. And they were writing viruses for fun. They weren't getting anything out of it. And we were trying to find these new viruses and build cure for them to protect our customers' computers. It was sort of like playing a game of chess, like trying to figure out how they spread and how they try to protect themselves. And when we were successful in decoding and adding detection, we were like, we won, excellent. But this game isn't a game of chess anymore. This game isn't very funny anymore because the enemy has changed. Now, don't get me wrong. Our security has increased tremendously, let's say, over the last 10 years. If you look at the built-in security of the things we use for computing today and what we were using in 2005, the difference is paramount. Even the built-in security of the operating systems like OS X and Windows, it's much, much better than what we were running 10 years ago. And it's even much, much better than when we compare it to new operating systems that have come to the marketplace, namely Android and iOS, which of course are much, much more restricted operating systems but also because they are restricted more secure. So if we would be fighting the enemy we had 10 years ago with the tools we have today, we would be in great shape. Unfortunately, we're not fighting the enemy from 10 years ago. The enemy has changed. And if we want to be able to protect our systems, we have to understand who are the hackers. Some of the hackers out there are guys like them. This is Charlie Miller and Chris Valasek. They're hackers, hackers like many of you. White hat hackers, good guys, security researchers. Charlie and Chris were the guys who made headlines this summer with their Chrysler Jeep hack, where they infamously took over, took over the control of a car remotely over the internet. So hackers, but the good kind of hackers. They don't break the law. But then we do have people who break the law. Hacktivists, movements like Anonymous, obviously they are breaking the law with their denial of service attacks and different kinds of defacements and so on. However, these guys are not trying to benefit anything by themselves. They aren't making any money. They do their attacks for purposes of protest or for a political motive. But the largest amount of attacks that we see are actually attacks coming from criminals, coming from people who do attacks to make money. They make money with credit card theft, with banking Trojans, with ransom Trojans, with rogue Bitcoin miners from botnets, and so on. But the biggest surprise to me over my career was the fact that governments themselves became one of the sources of attacks and malware. Governments writing malware. Governments deploying malware. Governments deploying malware against friendly countries. Stuff of science fiction. And turns out it's actually happening. Happening right now. We've learned so much about the secret things governments are doing with their cyber offensive tools over the last two years ever since the Snowden leaks. And by the way, we had a new batch of Snowden leaks just today, three, four hours ago, talking about things like how GCHQ was collecting traffic from sources like Reddit to do their intelligence gathering. And the reason why this intelligence gathering is being done, the most common explanation is that they're trying to find and fight terrorists. All right, we, of, of course we all want to fight terrorists. We don't like terrorism, but of course it's not the only reason why intelligence gathering and surveillance is being done. But don't get me wrong, terrorism is a real problem. It's also a real problem in the online world. And that is 
one of the groups we have to fight. Movements like the Islamic State, they turn out to be the first real-world terror group which actually has a credible cyber offensive capability. And what makes these guys different from all the other players is that they are willing to do the kinds of attacks that no one else is willing to do. They are willing to do attacks which make no sense. So a wide range of attackers. And the question is, are we missing someone here? Well, of course, we're missing probably plenty of different fringe groups. For example, the old school hobbyists. There still are some old school hobbyists out there, but the numbers of those are so low, they don't matter. They might be someone much more important that we're missing. Maybe we are missing companies, guys like him. <laughs> companies doing hacking for profit, like Volkswagen hacking the software of their cars to get better environmental readings, or Lenovo three times now putting spyware on their laptops by default, Sony shipping rootkits on their music CDs, IKEA going to extremes to target their users with tracking items when you visit their website, and so on, and so on. And then we have examples like Ashley Madison. I don't know if they did any hacking, but obviously the things they were doing were highly unethical. And I'm not speaking about the cheating part, like cheating your spouse through these systems. Like, for example, what they claim on their website, like these things, the, the trustee secured the award. I've never heard of this award. 100% discrete service. SSL secure site. Whoa, here we go. Turns out that when you were actually paying Ashley Madison money to get your data removed from their systems, they took you money, but they didn't remove the data. That's unethical, criminal, and so on. Now, some companies do take security seriously, and they act accordingly. And while the headlines this summer made it seem like Chrysler had a serious security problem in their car, I think this is actually a success story. So what Charlie Miller and Chris Valasek did with Chrysler is that they figured out a remote way to connect to the navigation and radio systems of this car. That's a Chrysler Jeep Cherokee. That system was online with a SIM card using 3G, 4G connections. And that Sprint card was from an operator called Sprint, which only operates in the United States. What Charlie and Chris did is that they got online with a Sprint SIM card of their selves, scanned the whole IPv4 address space, and they actually found that these connections to these cars were not being filtered if you were coming with the right SIM, which means they were able to connect remotely to the navigation systems, reflash the navigational systems, and then connect from the reflash navigational system to the CAN bus of the car, which is the bus which controls everything, the brakes, the steering, and so on. And let me play you a video what it actually means in practice. After their stunt on the highway, Chris and Charlie still wanted to show me a couple of other tricks. Below a certain speed, they can control the Jeep steering as long as it's in reverse, pop its locks, mess with the speedometer, and, of course, disable the brakes. Okay, hold on tight. Hold on. Oh, Here, getting into the car, Charlie Miller walking away, Chris Valasek, at the time, when they did this hack in June and July. Uh, Chris was working for Twitter. Uh, so Chris was working for IO Active. Charlie was working for Twitter. They were both recruited two weeks after Black Hat, where they made all this research public. And the, the success part from Chrysler's part was that when Charlie and Chris found these security vulnerabilities, they told Chrysler. In fact, they told Chrysler already in February. They told Chrysler already in February that we can reflash the navigation systems and jump from there to the CAN bus and do all these things. And now we're going to go public with this information in the Black Hat conference in the beginning of August. So now you have six months to fix this. And that's exactly what Chrysler did. Two weeks before Wired broke the story, the guy who was behind the wheel is Andy Greenberg, who works for Wired. Before his story became public, Chrysler had shipped the update two weeks early. So the system worked. The system worked. The vendor was notified. They were given a time to respond. They responded. They fixed the vulnerability. If you had one of these cards, you could go and download a patch and fix it. It turned out to be a little bit bigger deal than that. And in fact, the US authorities told Chrysler to recall 1.4 million cars to make sure they get actually fixed. Nevertheless, 
the system worked. So who did recruit Charlie and Chris? Who hired these guys? Uber did. Uber, the taxi company. And I was really surprised when I, uh, when I heard about this. Of course, I heard about it from, from Twitter. Sent my congratulations to Charlie and Chris, and, uh, and I was wondering about it, like, well, hold on, why is a taxi company hiring two of the best-known uh, vehicle security experts on the planet? So I went to Uber's website, to the recru recruitment pages, and just scrolled around. And I don't know what I was expecting. I suppose I was expecting Uber to be mostly recruiting taxi drivers and, uh, you know, sales and marketing people, maybe designers. Well, I was wrong. If you actually go there and took a look, take a look at what, who are they uh, hiring, you'll find, uh, well, first of all, you'll see that they have 12 different engineering locations, including one engineering unit in Lithuania, one in Milan, several in USA, and they're hiring guys like FPGA design engineers and machine learning specialists. Machine learning specialists and chip designers. What does this tell to us? Well, it tells to us that Uber is building a self-driving car. They're trying to get rid of the drivers. It's quite obvious. That's why they hired Charlie and Chris. That's why they're hiring these guys. It's an obvious play for them. They do have the, have the resources to do this now. And I'll tell you what. I can't wait for self-driving cars to become a reality. I can't wait for it to happen. Because once we have self-driving cars on our roads, the benefits are obvious to everybody. No more accidents or much less accidents, and traffic will be flowing like something from heaven. As we right now know, traffic isn't always easy, but when cars drive themselves and the people who are walking on the streets learn that cars don't hit them, traffic will look like this. And I can't wait for this to happen. This is going to be great. Now, I, of course, we're going to be getting a heart attack every time we go to the traffic, but, uh, but at least we won't be get hit by the cars. Now, I have to confess you something. This isn't actually real footage. This is all after effects done by uh, a guy called Fernando Livšić. But nevertheless, it's, uh, it's the future I'm really looking forward to. So if cars will be driving themselves, if planes are hackable, who do we actually have to worry about hacking those things? The typical movie brought threat scenario is that evil hackers will hack your cars to kill you, or evil hackers will hack our planes to crash them and to kill us. And I don't believe in theories like that. The vast majority of attackers we have are not interested in killing us. Like, why would they kill us? I mean, it's illegal to kill people. This isn't something we have to worry about unless the attacker is someone who's willing to do attacks which make no sense. And out of the different attacker groups we spoke about, the only one which would actually have a motive to do this would be extremists. Now, I did a fairly long study into the cyber offensive capabilities of real world terror groups around three years ago. Three years ago, we still didn't have Islamic State. So I was mostly researching Al-Qaeda and related groups. And my outcome of the research was that all these extremist groups used the online, used the internet to, to you know, get funding, to spread propaganda, to recruit. But none of them had skills or capabilities to do real cyber attacks or real terror attacks. But I did end my research three years ago with the words that this situation is unlikely to get better and it's likely to get worse. And that's exactly what has happened, especially now with the rise of ISIS. And whenever I see videos of ISIS, I always wonder about the same thing, which is that is Toyota sponsoring these guys? <laughs> For some reason, they always prefer Toyota. The kind of resources that ISIS have at their disposal are, or were, guys like him. This is Junaid Hussain, a British citizen, online criminal that we were actually tracking three years ago, a little less than that. 
as he was operating from the United Kingdom. At some stage, we lost, his, lost the track of him. When we found him again, he had left UK, moved to Syria, and changed his name to Abu Hussein al-Britani. And now he was online on Twitter tweeting threats to United Kingdom and USA governments.